The blackout murders, homicide in World War II. Nostalgic recollections of wartime Britain forget that when the blackout was enforced at night, an attempt to fo- an attempt to fill Nazi bombers, a crime wave cloaked by the inky darkness, ensued on many of our streets. There were petty crimes, robberies, sexual assaults, and as the blackout murders revealed, some horrific crimes took place on the home front during the Second World War. It is a new book by Neil Story. Delighted to be be joining me live from the UK, the author of uh, The Blackout Murders, uh, Neil himself. Neil, good good morning to you. Good morning, Giles. Good to be with you. Pleasure is all mine. We seem, don't we, to think of, we talk about the Blitz spirit, you know, the home front, the Britain can take it uh, attitude that we had during the Second World War. And indeed, the huge, pop, the huge majority of the population did that. But of course, when the blackout was enforced, the more nefarious amongst the society uh, could could practice could practice crimes and indeed carry out in sexual assaults and in these cases and as you found discovered murders. You're absolutely right. The concern was that when Britain was put into these blackouts, the idea being to if we've got enemy bombers coming over, we don't want to give away the positions of our town cities or any factories, you know. But businesses, shop owners, the police all, all were very alive to the fact that under this darkness, you're not going to be able to follow people, observe people very easily. And they knew that some people that had always thought, should I have a go at a crime? This would be the golden opportunity for that to happen. And there wasn't just a mini crime wave. In World War II, there was tragically a, a, a murder wave too. I mean, you would think during the horrors of a bombing campaign against the civilian population that wanting to carry out murder would be the least of any concern because everybody would be trying to survive. So are we just talking about warped criminality? Are we talking about the settling of, of, of gang stores, uh, gang um, scores? What, what, and I know this is, this is a bit of a, bit of a strange question. You can't really answer it quite easily, but what sort of, what sort of murders were taking place? Uh, if, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Yes, by all means, just about any type of murder, from sexual-based crime, murder for gain, to some of the most serious and most infamous serial killers in the history of British crime uh, took place during the Second World War. Uh, You had, uh, for example, Gordon Cummins was known as the Blackout Ripper, operating in London on a murder spree against the most vulnerable women he could find. They, they, they were ladies who were who were prostitutes uh, or part-time prostitutes. He, he was a horrible piece of work. But, but then you'll also see people like Haig, the acid bath murderer. Well, he began under the cloak of the blackout because he had a workshop in, in you know, pretty central to London. And he had... He was put, killing people down there, putting them into oil drums. But the acid that he dissolved them in filled the place with noxious fumes. So he was having to leave the door open and then go outside to get gulps of air. Otherwise, it, he would have passed out with the noxious fumes. And not to mention, you had, uh, for example, Reg Christie, the infamous killer, Mel- Mass- you know, he was a serial killer of 10 Rillington Place. Well, he be he in wartime checks weren't carried out that well, and he was a war reserve policeman. So his first offences, his first murders, were were carried out uh, when he was in the service of the police. A, a uniform people should be able to trust, mm. and he was burying women in the garden under the cloak of the blackout. It, it begs the question, how well, because we seem to think, don't we, that, okay, the blackout comes, you've got home guard or air raid wardens or, or whatever they, they were patrolling the streets, meaning that nobody would go out of the house. But I suppose you know, even even in a major conurbation such as London with people living cheek by jowl, if it's in, you know if it is dark and you can't see anything because obviously the blackout's being enforced, then you know you're not you're not going to have CCTV, are you? It's it's literally if you did get caught by a, a, a patrol, a blackout patrol, it was down to 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 luck rather than any sort of surveillance techniques. 
I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, catching Cummins, the blackout ripper. Well, it, he attacked a woman uh, not far from Piccadilly Circus, and he attacked her at a doorway, and his g- gas mask bag came off. And when it was found from the scene, uh, it contained his uh, a Royal Air Force number, which they, you know, every everybody in the services has a unique Army, Navy, Air Force number. And it was traced to him. And the questions were asked, and he, he was clearly the man who had done it. Uh, with, with Christie, he maybe would never have been caught. And the fear for, for Reg Christie about his case, and it's particularly dark, is that he was not stalking the, the streets. He was he would become acquainted with women, maybe those that had left a husband or that she was a work colleague, or maybe she had ter- occasionally turned to money for sexual favours. And when they went freely to the property at 10 Rillington Place. Um, for the friends and, they, and those he got to know, he he would try and make them think that they had something wrong with them, a cough, a cold, oh, I can cure that. Mm. Before he seemed with his soft voice, you know, he, he would say, well, I, I trained as a doctor before the war. And he connected up uh, a, a, an inhaler system uh, to the gas so as these women were sat in this ropey old deck chair in the kitchen, they would be breathing in this gas through a tube rather than what he said. was It was rather like uh, an inhaler, you know, like, like some sort of Benedict solution. You know? mm. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I, mean, I hadn't really thought about this before, but even during a blackout, there's going to be... A, a covert economy going on, and if you if you are involved in criminality in, ter- in terms of, you know, in terms of the black market, if you were, you know, an East End, if you're an East End gangster, you know, a small thing. If you're not off, if if you've managed to avoid conscription and whatever, then you're still yeah. going to be carrying on your, you know, your extortion, whatever, under the cover of darkness. And and again, and I hadn't thought about this before, but women are particularly vulnerable at this point because the male population of fighting age is off fighting and therefore there are lots of women basically on their own or raising small children or whatever and those women who have economic hardship and difficulty are going to turn to to prostitution or whatever in order to make ends meet and so they are so rather than saying oh well they were prostitutes and i was talking to a guest about the Yorkshire ripper not the only the other day they're going oh well yeah. they were only prostitutes it doesn't did they an almost that horrendous thing oh they, they kind of had it coming which is a terrible thing to say but there were vulnerable women out there so for a, a predatory a predatory walked male. This was this was an ideal situation. It really was. When when pe- you're in a fractured society in, in the Second World War, people would do things that they never thought they would do in peacetime. And there's one particular incident which shows how two people can spark each other off. There was an American serviceman. He was a deserter, and. He was flouncing around the Hammersmith area of London. And he met up with this very young... She's, she's young, she's 17, 18 years old, she's pretty, she's blonde, she's been... She wants to be an exotic dancer, but apparently she wasn't very good at the dancing. And so she becomes a waitress, and, um, you know, she's not desperately well-treated by some of the theatre owners. And she finds this American who is exciting, Americans were exciting. He appears to have some money. And he tells her that he was a gangster in America. And then people had seen the, the gangster films, you know, and you might remember the fears over video nasties back in the you know, 1980s, 1990s. The gangster sit- films were Edward seen G. to be... Robinson and all that, of course, yeah. You've, you've got it absolutely right. So... Some people are styling themselves on that. You can see the robberies and, and the and the language that is used by some of these people getting involved in robberies. But this young lady and this American deserter, they sparked each other, and she wants to know what it's like to be a, a gangster's mole. And they go out on what turns out to be a murder spree. And 
that they will drive out, for example, from from London, going towards on Reading on the on on the on the big main roads, in a vehicle he'd taken from a motor pool, and they might see somebody on a bicycle. They'd overtake the bicycle, pull on the side, listen for them coming by. He would step out and bang, hit the person off the bike, and might strangle them, might do something nasty, might beat them up, and she might be involved with just standing there, holding them down, and certainly assisted with the removal of the body down into into verges and ditches. One, one poor girl, she was even put into a river. But thank God, that brought her around, and she actually lived to tell the tale. But the, the point is, if that young couple, if that American serviceman and that pretty young barmaid come into Dana Dancer lady... If they had never met, they probably would have never committed the crimes that they did. How did how did the the police then? How did they? How could they police? How could they carry out investigations? It must have been because you know you were in a wartime situation. London is being bombed. All the major cities are being in the UK are being bombed. Um, so with what's going on? To I mean, it's it's before the terms of t- times of forensics, for example, and the investigation is pretty much it's pretty much at a basic stage. But you know, were the police able to, to carry out any any successful prosecutions, or was it again just? You know, murderers being stupid, as they often, uh, sometimes they often are, uh, or just getting incredibly good luck in terms of the police being able to to find literally cast iron pieces of evidence like ID tags or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a combination. A lot of murderers are stupid or they become arrogant and they think they can get away with it. And what you were dealing with in wartime, because a lot of the younger police officers had been called up under the National Service Act, you've got a lot of real old school coppers out there, you know, Inspector Greeno, Bob Fabian, the famous Fabian of the yard, old school, good coppers using old techniques and they you use and it's also the beginning of forensics uh professor keith simpson starts up what was really uh the first modern forensic well he, he called it a laboratory it was a room in the upper floors of a hospital but it soon developed and there was one particular incident called the blackout butcher and this was a curious case when a body of a woman was found in the wreckage of a chapel in London. Now you'd think, oh well, it's it's a bomb victim. Now if he'd just put her body underneath there, he might well have got away with it. But the body was underneath quite a heavy stone um, flag, and she, when they moved the body, it heavily dis- it, it, it decayed. But when they moved it, it appeared that she had been dismembered too. And you don't get that kind of clean cut from a. a you know, a, a saw or other dismembering objects from a bomb blast. And that's what sent them on on this search for a missing woman who had been reported missing by her uh, sister. But, of course, there's lots of people reported missing. But using the, I mean, it's real innovative techniques. Uh, Simpson gets an X-ray of the skull, of the body that was found. And the woman they think it might be it kind of fits the story. They superimpose an X-ray of the skull over her photograph, and it fitted. It matched, and that was quite a step forward in the world of forensics. My, my other thought is, if if they were there successful prosecutions carried out then during the war, I mean, did did court? I mean, and excuse my ignorance on this one, Neil, but. Presumably, courts were sitting, so they could actually carry out trials. Or were they? Did the, were they? These people, uh, when they were caught, were they uh, basically detained until until hostilities ceased? Courts were sitting throughout the Second World War. In fact, the judicial process was absolutely overwhelmed by the cases, because you had a lot of people who were had fled from uh, Germany, Austria. Uh, 
it, Italy as well. There were also those who who were committed fascists that were still in Great Britain after the outbreak of war and under Defence of the Realm uh, Regulations 18B, they were incarcerated. So they had to go before panels to be checked out. But magistrates were certainly busy. There were petty crimes. They were all tried. And the Central Criminal Court at the Old Bailey, yes, there were murderers, they were caught, and, and they were certainly sentenced. Haig, the acid bath murderer, and Christie, Reg Christie of Tenrillington Place, they were not caught until years after the Second World War. Infamously, you know, you've got, you've got wartime cases of spies as well. They, they were certainly tried. But one of the cases that I uncovered uh, was known in its day, but they didn't have all the computer technology to tie the two together. But there was, tragically, a, a group, several girls had been attacked in Cone in Lancashire, and the guy tried to strangle them and, and let down an attack. Then one night, a poor girl was stabbed at a bus stop in the blackout, and even she didn't realise how badly she'd been wounded. She was, she'd fallen to the floor, assisted onto a bus, but on the bus, she near enough bled to death. She died in the hospital. They never caught the person responsible for that horrible murder at Cone. But in 1944, a young WAF, a women's auxiliary air force member down at Ellef Airfield in Suffolk, she was found horribly murdered in a ditch. Now, she'd been strangled, she'd been sexually assaulted. So how could that connect with this crime in Cone? Well, they soon caught the man that killed this young WAF, Arthur Hayes, an, an aircraftsman, and they looked back on the cases, uh, the incidents on RAF bases where he had been stationed, and they found assault after assault, girls being strangled. But this guy has moved from place to place. And then where did it all begin? Where did he start off? Where was he from? Colin in Lancashire, and some of the final notes in the file noted about where he came from, noted that he uh, could well have be, been the man that committed the, the stabbing of the girl in Colin in Lancashire. But I'm not sure it was ever followed up because Hayes was tried, found guilty of the murder of that young waff, and he went to the gallows. Mm hmm. How did you come across these cases? Because I, you know, I, I, as I said to people, I'm that worst. I'm that worst sort of person. I'm the, the you know, the armchair historian. But the, the story of the American, the American serviceman and the wannabe mall, I've never heard of. So how did you uncover these? It, I've been a historian now for well over thirty years, and crime shines as <laughs> the shadow of crime passes over much of society. And I've always been drawn to to crime as an an illustrative tool to help students and anybody coming to my lectures uh, engage with the past, engage with the stories of the past. And I think it's important that we should remember the good and the bad uh, in all history. And over those years, I have collected these stories. And you know, when you dig, the more you dig the more you find, and, you, and you'll, you'll talk to colleagues. I spend a lot of time in archives as well, and I sift through newspapers I began before they went online. And sometimes you'll just find a little reference to an incident, and then suddenly you'll find, oh, that was quite a major incident in its day, but it was in local papers, the news didn't spread very far, or quite simply, it's been forgotten about. So, um, yeah, forgotten history, darker history, illustrative history. That's how this has all come about. And I suppose the main thing is, as well, is, to, is it's, it's history. It's important, you know, both, both the light and the dark. And if we just have a narrative that, you know, Britain stood together heroically, which it did during the, the Second World War, but not yeah. everybody, not everybody uh, was was playing by the rules to put it mildly and and so when people say oh well you know and they hark back to those glory days yes they were great but they they weren't exactly unblemished you're absolutely right in any society you'll find that there are good and bad in wartime britain there is talk of a wartime spirit there had to be 
It had to exist, otherwise we would not have got through. There were extraordinary acts of bravery, some of which was recognized, were re recognized with medals, others were never recognized. And many of those stories will probably never come out, particularly uh, uh, now that so many of that generation have passed away. But, and, and you know, if people were speaking uh, in, in non-patriotic ways, defeatist, that could also end you, end you up in court. So <laughs> you had to watch what you said. If you were repeating what Lord Haw Haw, the, the German radio broadcaster, was saying as fact, uh, that was bad for morale. So there's good, there's bad. Uh, but in this book, I think it's important that we do uh, remember these crimes, but above all, remember the victims of these crimes so that they are not forgotten. The book is called The Blackout Murders, A Homicide in World War II. It's by Neil R. Story, who are talking to you today. Neil, if people want to find out more about the book or yourself, um, is there a website? Can they find you on social media? Where can they, where can they find you? Yes, by all means. Have a little look on Pen and Sword Books. Look on the website. All of my books, uh, recent books are on there. There's a profile about me. And if you really feel moved to do so, you can always reach out and you'll find me on Facebook. Uh, we we'll look forward to that. And may I congratulate you on looking at that profile picture, particularly fine moustache, sir. I think there's enough of them, enough of them out there at the moment. Um, so um, the, <laughs> Thank you. the book, the book is the book is called oh, excuse me it said i've got distracted the blackout murders is the moustache homicide in world war Two. it's by neil story neil thank you so much for your time today thank you giles